Welcome back. Let's get ready for part two, land-based people and seasonal rounds. Remember that we talked about these two ways of seeing the world. Um, one of them is called land-based values. And this picture over here kind of illustrates that you've got a human and that human is kind of part of all the things around her, all of these things. The human is one with the earth and they are a part of that system. Humans take care of nature and nature takes care of humans. The creator commands them to be stewards of the land and resources. Some call this the covenant with the creator. This worldview protects the environment. Now, the other one we're referring to as Judeo-Christian values, and this refers specifically to the part of the Bible, maybe you're familiar with this, that says um, God commands humans to conquer the land. And in Genesis, it says, and, whoops, I'm having a hard time reading it, and subdue it and have domination over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Humans control nature in this view. So here's a human and she is on top of the world in charge of all the rest of these things that are of and in the world. And it's not saying that one is better and it's not saying that one is worse. But it's just very important to look at how very different these two ways are and think about do these two ways really work together? Here's a visual example of land based values uh, versus Judeo Christian values. So in uh, in this picture, you can see that the man is just standing right there in the river, catching the salmon with his hands. He's got, um, he's adapted to the environment by the clothes that he's wearing, and he's only got one. That's one fish, probably just for him and his family. Now, in this bottom picture, we can see um, here's a man also dressed to adapt to the environment, but he has quite a few more than one fish. And I don't believe any of these fish are going home to his family. He is working for a company that's going to sell those fish. So two different ways of interacting with our environment. Not saying one is better, not saying one is worse, but it's important to understand the difference. Land-based values where humans take care of nature and nature takes care of humans. Um, or Judeo-Christian values where humans control nature and use it to our advantage. I'm going to read a bit from this amazing book called The People of Cascadia. Um, and that kind of goes into more detail about how those land-based values played out in uh, what is now Washington State. The seasonal rounds. The people of Cascadia were entirely interconnected with the nature, natural world around them. They wore the soft furs, wool, and feathers from the animals they shared their homeland with, along with fibers from the plants of the forest, meadow, and stream. They made their home from trees that came from the great forests of the land and traveled in canoes made from the finest of these trees. They harvested huge quantities of food to store for the long, rainy winters in containers made from bark and wood. They healed themselves with special herbs, barks, and roots. Their spiritual life was deeply connected to the natural life around them. The mountain goat lives high in the Cascades and has some of the finest wool in the world. The salmon runs the rivers in millions, and elk are the size of a cow. There are plentiful berries, new shoots, greens, nutritious roots, bulbs, and tubers of all kinds 
to store for winter. In order to harvest enough of these many resources for warmth, shelter, food, medicine, and ornament, the people were keenly aware of the seasonal progression of ripening. They knew which foods were ready as one traveled higher into the mountains or out onto the islands. They harvested these resources in what is called the seasonal rounds, each season filled with harvests of different kinds throughout the circle of the year. The moons and the seasonal rounds calendar. Each lunar cycle from the moon, from new moon to new moon represents a lunar month in the Northwest calendar. Each moon is named for its relationship to the seasonal rounds of daily life in the village. For the Coast Salish people, these include the summer berry moons, the elk calling moon, the digging moon, and the silver salmon moon. Each group named their moons in accordance with their seasonal rounds calendar. The first song of the Pacific Chorus Frog means that the warming time has begun and the new shoots will soon be ready for harvest, beginning a new year of seasonal rounds of food gathering. The people knew when it was time to harvest certain plants and animals by observing signs in nature. When nettle is knee high and thimbleberry shoots are ready for harvest, it is time to go to the seashore to harvest seaweed. When the flowering dogwood is in peak bloom, it is time to go down to the bay to harvest the sweetest clams. When red alder has leafed out it, no, sorry, when red alder has leafed out, it is time to pull the cedar bark for baskets and clothes. The bird song of the Swayson's thrush ripens the salmon berries, which is a sign that the salmon are returning. Along the rivers, the fireweed blossoms mean blackberries are ready to harvest. Across the mountain, when the robin and meadowlark begin to sing, it is time to harvest biscuit root. When black hawthorn berries are ripe, it is time to go up to the mountains to pick black mountain huckleberry. All these and more are the seasonal indicators for a seasonal rounds of gathering in Cascadia. So we're looking at a calendar. This is basically kind of what we use, what we humans use in our culture to keep track of what day it is, what month it is, what time of the year it is. Um, it's basically a grid or a table system and it should be familiar to all of us. We see this and we immediately know this is a calendar. Now I wanna show you kind of a different kind of a calendar. This circle, this is a calendar too. What evidence do you see that supports the idea that this is a calendar? I can point out that it talks about seasons. Hold on a second, here we go. I see winter at the top. I see spring on the side. And I see summer at the bottom and I notice that as it gets warmer out, like starting in spring, there's more, 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 and more fish, more salmon. And then here's fall right here, still lots of salmon in the fall. So how could this be a calendar? So basically how this is a calendar is that it's telling you which time of year you can find which types of foods and so these folks kept track of time based on what food was ready at what time of year this is very important because you know it's not like they were just going to go to the store or order it up on amazon fresh or whatever they had to physically 
go up into the mountains and go into the woods or go down to the beach and the islands and get the food and harvest the food. So you don't want to go to all that trouble if the food is not going to be there when you get there. So this is really what drove the calendar. This is what drove a lot of things, the seasonal rounds. And of course, uh, because the state of Washington has very different climates, very different geographies throughout, the seasonal rounds um, were different based on what part of the state you were in. For example, these were the seasonal rounds of the people of the plateau. And these are the seasonal rounds of the people of the lower Columbia. Do you notice any different food sources between those two? These are the seasonal rounds of the people of the Salish Sea. And that is basically where our seasonal rounds would have been if we were living this way in Seattle right now. You can see that that part of the map covers Seattle. And these are the seasonal rounds of the people of the West Coast. So all the way out at the beach. And this is how it was from season to season, from year to year, to decade to decade, year after year since time immemorial, this is how the people of Cascadia lived. But it couldn't stay this way. And that's the part that we're getting to next in the unit. And how appropriate that an airplane is flying over right now, I tell you. Because what we are going to talk about now, picking up where we left off, is uh, what we'll call first contact. When white people who were descendants of the Europeans who had come here made their way out west and came upon these cultures and came upon this land. We're going to talk about how that happened and what happened in each phase. I will see you soon.